Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your attendance this afternoon at the public lecture of Professor Uwe Puse from the University of Basel in Switzerland um, for his talk on active healthy children in marginalized communities, challenges, achievements, and vision for the future. Thank you very much to Professor Cheryl Foxcroft um, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Teaching and Learning at Nelson Mandela University, who will be introducing Professor Uwe Puse this afternoon. And thank you for your attendance, the Dean, Deputy Dean Professor Van Rooyen, as well as our Director of School, Professor Sorgi. So thank you. Professor Foxcroft, please, thank you. Philip, there's no um, box for me to stand on. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a joke. You were, um, that normally I have to have a box over here, and now they tease me all the time about it, so I get my dig in when I can. <laughs> Colleagues, it's um, lovely to be here with you today and to see all of you. Some I know, some I don't know. I know we've got university colleagues, we've got colleagues from Department of um, Basic Education with us and probably other community people as well. So lovely to have you with us today from the university side. And my job is to introduce our distinguished guest this afternoon. And I say distinguished because if you read his full CV, you will realize um, just what a distinguished person we have over here. So Prof. Uwe Pusser is a full professor of sports science at the University of Basel, Switzerland, and head of, the part of the Department of Sport, Exercise, and Health. He holds the UNESCO Chair on physical activity and health in educational settings, and has recently been award, awarded an honorary professorship at Nelson Mandela University. I told Prof. Pusa I was actually on the committee that did that, uh, that made that decision, and that's where I saw that very impressive CV. And when you do look at the CV, he has published more than 100 peer-reviewed articles, several books and book chapters, and has held many leadership positions in various professional bodies. He has received awards for his international contribution to the development and promotion of physical education and sport. And Prof. Pusa has recently, as I said, been awarded his profess honorary professorship here. Um, and this was particularly in rec to recognize as well his contribution to the university through his collaborative efforts with the Department of Human Movement Science and the level of distinction he has achieved in the academic field. Prof. Pusa has facilitated a decade-long collaboration with the Department of Human Movement Science, which has spanned three large research projects. They've got different acronyms, so there was the DASH study, the Kazi Afya study, and the Kazi Bantu project which aims to promote physical literacy and healthy active living of school children and teachers in marginalized areas of South Africa and abroad. This decade-long collaboration has facilitated, amongst others, the teaching of physical education in a number of primary schools in the northern areas and the townships of Kabacha, and selected schools in Tanzania, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal. It's also facilitated the development and conducting of short learning programs for teachers in the field of physical education, the upgrading of play areas and toilet facilities at schools, which has been part of the Kazi Play research on communicable and non-communicable diseases of children and teachers at 28 schools in Kobeja. And then on the more academic side, he has been involved and been supervising HPHDs, four from Switzerland and four from South Africa, a number of master's theses, and more than 30 publications in international refereed journals that have come out of these projects. So Prof. Pusa, please feel very welcome here, and we look forward to the lecture that you're going to give us on active, healthy children in marginalized communities, challenges, achievements, and vision for the future. Welcome. Thank you very much. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Prof. Foxcroft, for these kind words of introduction. I think I don't have to mention that it is a huge honor for me to stand here and to speak to you about the research and practical work which we have done in the last 10 years together here. Uh, there are hardly any moments and possibilities to paint a big picture of a project. Normally you have a research lecture and so on, you just present a part of it, but today we have the chance to span the whole story from the beginning to the end, and that is my task today. So a very well, warm welcome to all of you. First of all, very nice that you introduced me, Prof. Gerald Foxcroft. I would also like to say a warm welcome to Darlene van Royen, Professor, Deputy Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Thank you for being here. And Prof. Solika Soji, Director of the School of Behavioral and Lifestyle Sciences. Thank you very much. I also see that the director of dietetics is also here, Anneli Gresser. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a huge honor that also Mr. Gorgonzola just arrived. He is the district head of Department of Education and so many colleagues, friends here in the room and online. I have no idea how many people are listening. I will listen to that. I will hear about that later. Otherwise, my nervous feelings are even rising. <laughs> so thank you. For all those who are listening online, this is the place where we are. My, meanwhile, right now, the Nelson Mandela University. And we have a wonderful, thank you very much. By the way, the technical support here is amazing. These guys uh, congratulations, really. Uh, that is... Yeah, I am really impressed, I must say that. Yeah, so we are here in the Mandela University, a wonderful place. When I came here more than 10 years ago, I was wondering what I saw there, a zebra on the campus of a university. <laughs> uh, that is the natural resort around it. You can also see the sea in the background. So that is an amazing place here. And I took this picture from uh, the office of the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Prof. Mutwa. And it's an amazing view from there, I must say. Yeah, that is to say, today is a special day because it is load shedding and some of the people might have had not the possibility to come or join online. It's a special issue here in South Africa, the load shedding problem. Hopefully, it won't affect my lecture today. We will see, so cross fingers and so on. This is the place where I come from. Completely different setting. This is the River Rhine. It is a city where life science is a huge topic big pharmaceutical companies, a big university, and the university is an old university. It was founded in 1460. So a lot of tradition. And you see here in the middle, this is the Pope, who in the church gave the permission that Basel could have a university in 1460. We, I am working in the medical faculty in the Department of Sport, Exercise and Health, Medical department has five, medical faculty has five departments. We are in one of them, Department of Sport, Exercise and Health, 550 students, 85 staff members. And I came here to South Africa first in 2011, no, in 12. In 11, I met Cheryl at a conference in Limerick in Ireland. I saw her for the first time at the time, and she said, we were I need support. We need support in South Africa because we have challenges there related to physical activity and physical education, especially in marginalized settings. I'm looking for someone who can support me. And then I said, just, Cheryl, that's fine. This person is standing in front of you. So let's see what we can do together. And at that time, she invited me to come here. And this was the first picture. I took here on the campus 
with people. We were a quite small group. You see Rosa Durant, Prof. Rosa Durant and others. At that time, there were monkeys running around us. That was a completely new situation for me. And when we came back to Cheryl's office, we had to close the door because the monkeys were stealing the cookies. <laughs> this was a new challenge for me. I, I, I had never to protect my cookies in Basel from monkeys. <laughs> So there was a funny thing, but the challenges continued. That is to say, we went to special places here. We saw wonderful places, no doubt, but I want to speak about the challenges. And the challenges here, we met them and we saw them when Cheryl once took me to Durham Road. Durban. Durban, Durban Road. Durban Road. Yeah. And in the afternoon, I came back to the department. And they asked me, where have you spent your morning? And I said, I was in Durban Road. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> How can you go there? It is dangerous. Yeah, it was really a special place. Yeah. I don't want to speak so much about extremes, but this is part of the topic I'm talking about today. That is to say, Port Elizabeth has wonderful places on the coastline, but we are working in the backside, that is to say, in places where I had the feeling that some South African inhabitants have never been, and they don't know so much about the situation there. And that is why I want to point out and describe a little bit what I perceived coming from Switzerland and came into these settings. It is not that I want to come and say this is bad, this is bad. No, it is a description of the situation. By the way, it was never the case that we came and had the feeling that we are superior and something like that. No, it was always on eye level. It was always an exchange in order to share our knowledge and to see how can we collaborate and improve the situation. So, we went into these places here, and you can see these are my three topics. I want to speak about challenges, I want to speak about achievements, and vision for the future. So these are my three chapters, and I start with challenges. And recently, we had a meeting with um, um, the foundation in Switzerland, the Julius Baer Foundation, and the deputy CEO, Natalie, um, she told us the situation and showed this, this map here. And this was an impressive map. And uh, Natalie Jean Baptiste, sorry, Natalie. Um, ja Natalie showed this map here, which was very interesting for us because this is a map about the wealth inequality in the world. And you can see that South Africa is on top. And Namibia is the second. So this is, at that time I heard that South Africa is the land of the haves and have-nots. And then Natalie showed this picture here. And this picture sometimes shows more than a thousand words. That is to say that on the one hand, there is a wealthy situation. On the other hand, there is a poor situation. And in states and countries where this difference between those who have and those who have not, there and where the differences are very extensive, there the social pressure, the social problems are mostly the highest. And that's what we perceived. Here is also a map here from <coughs> the, uh, the Nelson Mandela Bay area. And you can see the blue are the black Africans, <clears throat> the yellow, the colored. <clears throat> the green ones are the small community of the Indians living in Malabar, mostly. And you see where the white population is living. So that is somehow differentiated. Differentiate. There's a, some kind of a friendship between them. So this was the challenge, and we have always try to videotape it, and I will add to my lecture some short video clips.
health prevents millions of children from attending school or getting the most out of their school days. It robs them of their ability to grow, learn and reach their full potential. Kazibantu works to empower children and their teachers with the knowledge they need to live healthier lives. Empower children in order to live healthier lives. That was our aim and we saw there is a need for that. Because when I came from Europe, from Switzerland, and I am German myself, so uh, we, when we speak about kids, about children, for, do we speak about those kids in Europe. And that is 150 million, so not so much. In Africa, we have 400 million, nearly three times as much. <clears throat> and especially children in poverty, we have 663 million. And in extreme poverty, even 385. So this population, those in poverty and those in extreme poverty, they are not on our screen in uh, Europe. We also have poor kids, no doubt, but not in this extension as we can see it here. So we visited schools. Gerald took me to schools. I learned about quintiles. I saw quintile five schools in a good shape and so on, mostly white schools and so on. But then we went to the school of Bruce Darmans. Obviously, he is sick online. Uh, Bruce, hello. We saw a wonderful organized school there, Sapphire Road, and we learned about the challenges there. Bruce had organized this school in a very wonderful manner. We could speak to uh, parents, we could peak, speak to the kids and saw the challenges there, especially in Quinta Three Schools, and that's what we focused on. But right in the neighborhood, it looked like that, and that is not a healthy place, that's not a place for physical activity. This is the setting down there, and it is not an extreme picture, it is a setting uh, which is quite normal there. So that is to say, we saw that we are facing barriers. And in the beginning of our collaboration, we asked SIPE to put together some of the barriers which the teachers and so on face. And the barriers are, for example, there are not enough facilities, absolutely no gym halls, no swimming halls, nothing like that. And the, the playing ground which is there, that is not safe. We have safety risks uneven surfaces. We will see that on the next slide. Glass on the field and so on. Children play on concrete surfaces. And when you look at the attire of the kids, the learners wear their school uniform for doing physical education when it is offered. Mostly it is not offered. Most children cannot afford to have sport clothes and sometimes they are torn or don't fit. So we also made a techie drive. That's a story for its own. We had techies for the kids, and sometimes the size was 45, so it didn't fit so good for the kids, you can imagine. But uh, it was really impressive there. So it looked like this here. This is the unfortunate infrastructure for the situation there in order to have physical activity and physical education. So, areas, uneven surfaces, glass, stones, and so on, and so on. And this is the situation in a break. The kids have no facilities to be physically active. They do it like this. Yeah, the situation, we spoke to the kids, uh, they get a school meal there. We asked them on Monday, when did, when did you eat for the last time? They said Friday in school. That is to say no, no meals in the weekend. So this was the situation. But the other situation was health and hygiene, the water situation. This is how the kids got their water. And you can imagine that the water is not clean and safe, and that is the reason 
for many infections, and we looked at these infections later on. What do the kids take for breakfast? Lots of kids get a rant, and from this rant, they buy sweets and chips. Here are the vendors for one rand, and they eat it for breakfast. And what happens with those, the, with the rest, they throw it into the toilet. The bags of chips end up there and clog up the toilets. And we visited the toilets, and the toilets were in a horrible state. You couldn't breathe there. And Cheryl, we were yesterday, we will speak about that later on in schools, and they say that is a major issue, the toilets which are unhealthy and which are the source of infections. And if we continue working in this field, we have to pay special attention on the health and hygiene, especially in the bathrooms, in the toilets, clean water, and so on. We are working on that, but we will speak about that later on. So, another short video. Lifestyle, physical inactivity, for example, and nutritional issues, for example, the consumption of high sugar and salt diets, have emerged as new leading risk factors for human health, accounting for 10% of the global burden of disease as expressed in disability-adjusted life years. Studies have revealed that the South African population has shifted towards a disease profile similar to that of Western countries, with increasing numbers of deaths attributed to chronic diseases. Despite this shift, however, infectious diseases that are intimately connected to poor living conditions and poverty continue to occur in marginalized communities and affect school-aged children in poor neighborhoods in South Africa school classes and we looked at the situation in the classes and we learned about the challenges of teachers and I must say I have a lot of respect for what the teachers here in South Africa in Quinta three schools are doing schools classrooms look like this overcrowded sometimes small classrooms and packed with kids at least 40 sometimes 60 or even more and imagine that you have to make a physical education lesson with this, uh, with this population here, with these kids. And you are not educated for physical education. And you should do a lesson outside where there are no facilities. It is impossible. It is impossible. And so there are another barriers, the large class sizes, limited space and equipment, limited sport equipment, so equipment is usually, usually in a bad condition, and sometimes, I've not seen that, but I was told that it is even stolen. So stealing, theft, is another issue. We went to another school. This looked like this, criminality. Schools have to be protected by fences. Otherwise, things are stolen, like the computers here. They are protected like this. So otherwise, there are challenges that these computers are on Mondays no longer there because they have been stolen in the weekend, which happens like we perceived in this school. I took this picture because I couldn't believe it. The thieves had come from through the roof in the weekend. So they climb down, take the computers, and leave again through the roof. Yeah, and in the morning, on Monday morning, people come to the office and nothing is no longer there. This is a challenge also for our activities now because uh, sustainability is our issue and if you want to have sustainability, these things have to be in place and have to be okay, all right. But we went to Helen Vale. Helen Vale is a special area. This is a painted wall in Helen Vale. Helen Vale and Hillcrest challenges, which we saw, even heavier than in other quintile three schools. And in these areas, teachers even don't feel comfortable to have physical education or something like that outside because it might not be safe for them. So other challenges which we have that the teachers who perceive this situation have a ne negative perception of te teaching PE. They have no professional training. They lose confidence in themselves. 
they perceive physical education as less important. So this is really a challenge and there is lack, the lack of PE teachers. No wonder, because it is really hard to do this job. It is really hard. Yeah. And Cheryl Water summarizes the situation with her words. With the introduction of curriculum reforms in 1997, physical education lost its subject standalone status in the school curriculum. We also have a shortage of qualified physical education teachers, especially in our poorest schools, and the class sizes are usually quite large. In addition, many disadvantaged schools in South Africa are poorly resourced. Playgrounds are in a poor state. So we have bad infrastructure in general. We have large class sizes. We have high crime rates. We have safety issues like even shootings during the day. We have no physical education, teacher education in the universities for these teachers. PE is not a standalone subject. It has a low reputation. We have a lack of qualified PE teachers. We have snacking, lack of healthy school meals and so on. We have lack of clean toilets and water, lack of parental support sometimes. This is the big picture. It is not a very positive picture, but this is the situation. And that's how we started, Cheryl, isn't it? We looked at it and then we said, should we leave it with the an analysis? And in these situations, always the word of Nelson Mandela are very inspiring for us. And Nelson Mandela said, we can change the world and make it a better place. It is in our hands to make a difference. So it is in our hands. Yeah. So we sat together and said, what can we do? And we are always also inspired by the motto of Nelson Mandela University, which says, change the world. Yeah, I mean, we can't change the world, but we can make a small difference. And we started to make this small difference by the DASH study. So this was funded by the Swiss South African Research Foundation. We started in 2014. And this was a project with a small group in the beginning. These were the participants, Cheryl, Prof. Durand, and Bruce from the South African side. Marcus in the middle, he is now a professor. He's a very skillful professor. He was responsible for a lot of publications, which we had meanwhile, more than 30 in our project. Harry was responsible for the statistics. And we see here a very important partner, the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. Without them, we wouldn't be here. With Jörg Utzinger on the left and his collaborators, Peling Yap, Dr. Steinmann, and Ivan was at that time not a doctor. He is now also a doctor. So this was the team, a smaller team. But we shared our expertise and we started with the field work. First, we had to generate academic evidence. Without evidence based, we didn't want to do something. We wanted to know about the population, about the health status, about the needs and so on. So it started and it started like this. There are two phases of the study. The first phase involves a cross-sectional survey and implementation of a cluster randomized controlled trial and includes the baseline testing of 1,000 grade four school children aged between nine and 12 from disadvantaged primary schools in the Port Elizabeth area. A total of 103 quintile three primary schools from disadvantaged communities in Port Elizabeth were invited to be considered to participate in the study. The project documents were hand delivered to each of the 103 schools due to many schools not having working telephones, fax machines, or emails. Written responses were received from 25 schools. The study leaders undertook to be inclusive and invited interested principals, grade four teachers, and school governing bodies to an information meeting in October 2014. Eight schools were finally included, with selection based on grade four class sizes and geographical location. Permissions from parents and guardians of a proper- I am very happy that several of the principals are here. So a very warm welcome that from 2014, we have contact with these principals and they 
are here now for listening and sharing the interest, this chair, sharing the expertise with us. So, what did we do? Just the selection. We collected stool and urine samples because we wanted to know about the infections. You saw the water and so on, the sanitation situation. So it was quite funny. We brought it here to the laboratory. Excellent collaboration here with the laboratories and so on. Yeah, some kids had forgotten their boxes at home and uh, they came with an empty one and we asked, where's your stool? And then they, <laughs> and they turned around and ran home. <laughs> Uh, so it was weird, funny moments, yeah. But we could see here already that in some parts of our studies here, the infection rate was more than 60%, especially in these areas. This is Helen Vale and Hillcrest, and so on. So the kids were heavily infected with worms. And we learned about a new word. I have never heard that before, stunting. Stunting here, WHO defines it as the impaired growth and development that children experience from poor nutrition, repeated infection, and inadequate psychosocial stimulation. The impact, the consequences of being stunted is poor cognition and educational performance, low adult wages, and lost productivity. So we had research on that. This is, for example, from Steffi Gall. She wrote her PhD. We have in our project, meanwhile, eight PhDs. Two are completed. Six are going on. Four of them here in South Africa, the Human Movement Science Department, in collaboration with us. So this is an achievement, I would say. We, um, the most important thing is that we change something, but we also have to develop the academic collaboration and bring publications and something like that because that is important for the university. And Steffi did research. I just give just a few selected impressions of that. So she looked at the attention, she made attention tests, and she looked at those here in yellow. You see the infected kids and in green the, the non-infected. So the possibility or the, the um, Intention, the um, possibility of, of being attentive is highly much more prevalent in those who are not infected. And yet now you can see the stunted, the, the red ones, and the non-stunted. And you can see that also the stunted are in a not so good situation, that is to say, they are not performing as they should. And the same is with academic achievement. We looked at the, uh, the marks at the end of the year and so on, academic achievement, and you can see the non-infected, the green scored highest on, on left, the infected, and you can see a similar situation with the stunted and no stunted. So being stunted is not a good situation in order to be successful in life. But now, one of our uh, PhD students, um, Daniel, uh, will explain what we did in the physical fitness testing. This is a little bit longer, this series, but it, is, it was key for our studies. Day two consisted of physical fitness testing using the Eurofit fitness testing battery. In order to get a comprehensive view of the children's fitness levels, the testing protocol aims to measure cardiorespiratory endurance, upper and lower body muscle strength, flexibility, as well as coordination and speed. All tests were explained in the children's home language and were demonstrated prior to the children conducting the tests. The 20 meter shuttle run is a running course that is pre-measured and marked out with various color cones. Starting with the running speed of 8.5 km per hour, the frequency of the pre-recorded sound signal increases gradually, such that every minute the pace increases by 0.5 km per hour. Level five, four. Equipment, no sport shoes. Children running groups of 15 to 20 
which allowed two shuttle runs per class. The children ran with kids coaches who set the pace and four children were assigned per kids coach to record the number of laps completed, as well as to encourage the children and ensure that they ran correctly. The 20 meter shuttle run is a measure of cardiorespiratory endurance. The children thoroughly enjoyed this test as they were able to cheer their classmates on as they participated in the test. The standing broad jump required that each child stand behind the line and jump as far forward as possible, landing with both feet without falling backwards. The distance of the jump was measured from the starting line to the heel of the, of the most back foot. The standing broad jump test is a measure of lower body strength. The grip strength test required that each child grip the hand dynamometer as hard as possible. Each child was given three trials, beginning with their dominant hand and a 30 second break was provided between trials. The child was placed in a relaxed seated position, elbow flexed at 90 degrees and the wrist in a neutral position. And this test was able to measure upper body strength. The sit and reach test measures flexibility of the hamstring muscles and to a minor extent the lower back muscles. The children were instructed to take their shoes off and place the soles of their feet against the sit and reach box. With hands placed over each other, the children were required to reach as far forward as possible in order for a measurement to be taken and recorded. This test measures flexibility. The jump sideways test requires children to jump laterally with both legs as many times as possible within 15 seconds across a wooden bar, which measures coordination and speed of the leg muscles. So we collected data and these data went into publications. So we had evidence, we had published something which we could build on. And we had conclusions. Some of them conclusions were that the physically fit and active children have a better concentration performance, that infected children have lower school grades and can less concentrate, that physical activity to active children have a better health-related quality of life, that physical activity intervention buffer children's school grades, and so on. So this is just the selection of results we had and we could build on these results and then come to the practical side. Because in many cases we have a lot of words but nothing happens later on. And we wanted to change something. And so we started with the intervention first. And then the DASH intervention came with two, with four topics medication and deworming, physical education and fitness program, that is our topic, our main topic, nutritional intervention and health and hygiene education. And I give you a short insight what has been developed there. Especially now in Kazibantu later on, we based our work on the CAPS. We always wanted to integrate what we do into the curricula which are already there. We want, didn't want to build a separate world. So physical education, moving to music and health and hygiene. And we developed curricula for grade one to seven. And we did it with teachers here, with students from Nelson Mandela University from Basel, who sat together and developed these material because we didn't want to have the situation that we from Basel come and develop things for here. So moving to music, why did we do that? Because we had these big class sizes. We wanted to give teachers the chance that they can teach 60, 70 kids at a time. And the Herald, we will hear about the Herald later on again, 
They said, teach us toolkits aimed to get pupils moving. And they presented our project in the newspaper. And the situation was as follows. They didn't have the equipment. They didn't have music boxes. So we had to bring them music boxes so that they had, could do moving to music. And look, this looked like this. Project together. We want to support the schools, the principals, the teachers to improve the situation in the schools. Because he want to. Do you enjoy moving and exercising? But moving to music, you can't imagine what happened on the schoolyard. This was an atmosphere. The kids like to move. They like to dance. That's an intrinsic motivation that is wonderful. It is really impressive. And when I talk about it, I get goosebumps because it was really close to my heart when I saw that. And then, of course, health and hygiene and nutrition. And then Prof. Gress came on board with her team speaking about dietetics and so on, washing hands, but we also looked at the food preparers. They prepare food for the kids every day and present them a healthy school meal. It should be healthy, but sometimes it is not. So we had to analyze the situation. And there, the Department of Dietetics came in with their expertise. We analyzed teams. In addition, each school's feeding program was analyzed. A dietitian inspected the food preparation and cooking facilities at schools and gathered information from the meal servers and other personnel responsible for the school feeding program. The products sold by school tuck shops and informal vendors were also noted. Recommendations and training will be provided in the next phase of the study in relation to cooking methods, hygiene practices, and ways to make food production more efficient. The vendors and tuck shop managers will also be informed about healthier snack choices. So the team grew. You will see that later on. But now the topic is what can we really do? Education is the most powerful weapon. Yeah, we had to stress our educational efforts. But first of all, let's summarize what happened. First, we made an analysis of the setting. Then we came to the DASH study and get the fun, got the funding. We did the assessments, we made the interventions, we made the publications, so step by step we developed it. Then we came to Kazibantu and the sub-projects, and I will speak about one of the sub-projects now. First started with Kazi Kids, Kazi Health is a huge topic which we developed with Durell van Hoynen. She's not here today, but um, she's a very intensive collaborator with us. Kazi Play, I will talk about that later. We, had, we made efforts to implement and disseminate and we designed short learning programs. So these were the stones which one to another came together in order to build this wall and project. Now it's about our future work. Why is that important? We created all these different aspects of the Kazibantu study, which I now pointed out. But now we are here in order to develop a vision for the future. Why is that necessary? Because the UNESCO chair is awarded always for four years, from 2019 to 2023. That is to say, in spring next year, the program, our UNESCO chair will come to an end. But I can tell you already now that UNESCO is very keen on that we continue, but we have to develop a strategy and that's why we are here. We sat together this morning and the next days in order to develop this strategy. And this strategy is important and we have some kind of visionary aspects which we want to follow up in the next years. First of all, meanwhile, there are a lot of huge organizations who support our ideas and where we are in line with them. You see all these documents, I will separate them a little bit. 
and start on the left side the WHO. They have clear recommendations for physical activity for kids. You can see kids from 5 to 17 years, they should be active at least 60 minutes per day, especially in moderate to vigorous intensity. Lots of these kids do not do that. In the school, there are no offers, and <clears throat> when they go home, it is not safe, and they don't play outside. And they play with their computer, with their cell phone, if they have one, or something like that. Especially, this is true, schools are the most relevant channel where all children, especially those from low socioeconomic status families, have access to a diverse range of physical activities. This is WHO. The next organization is the OECD. The OECD has a program which is called the Future of Education and Skills, Education 2030. And in this program, they have a report on the right side making physical education dynamic and inclusive for 2030. They include, meanwhile, physical education in their program. You know from UNESCO the PISA studies, and the PISA studies only looked at science, mathematics and reading, everything for the brain. If you look at that, the, the child don't need a body, it's only brain-centered. But I always say, ah, to the school comes the whole child, and the child has a body. And there is a relationship between the body and the brain. And I had the chance to present this report at an OECD conference in Seoul in 2019. And from that time on, OECD thinks a little bit different. They made me, on the left side here, to a so-called thought leader for physical and mental health. And I would like to read what is there. They speak now of core foundations of education. And four uh, core foundations mean they are the fundamental skills, knowledge, attitudes, and value that are prerequisites for further learning. And you can see the three points. Cognitive foundations, no doubt, always been there. But here, health foundations, including physical and mental health. So OECD extended their view on to the whole child. It's not only the brain. And of course, social and emotional foundations. So we are in line with what OECD is doing. And our main partner is UNESCO. And I must say, UNESCO is doing a great job uh, with regard to physical activity and physical education. You know they have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And we, in our work, focus on two of them, three and four. You can see them good health and well-being, and quality education. These are the main goals which we, in our work here, in our UNESCO chair, with our team, focus on. That is to say, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, and ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So they have really helpful documents and initiatives like this document, the Quality Physical Education. And this here is Irina Bokova, the former General Secretary, Director of UNESCO. She signed our contract, our UNESCO chair contract at that time. She said, our vision is clear. Sport and physical education are essential to youth to healthy lives, to resilient societies, to the fight against violence. So UNESCO is on our side. Exactly what we are doing is backed up by that what uh, UNESCO says. But this does, does not happen by itself. It takes action by the governments and support from the international community. So we have to be active. It doesn't come from alone. And UNESCO is active in also in other directions. And they have a new concept, which is called Fit for Life. It is brand new. 
I'm involved in this organization and so on. And there are two events which one happened two weeks ago. And there is a meeting next year in Baku in Azerbaijan where all the ministers uh, responsible for physical education and sport meet. And they say that physical education is a fundamental right for kids also in South Africa, I would say. Recalling further that the Kazan Action Plan, Kazan was the city where the last MINEPS conference took place. They have an action plan and now it is implemented. And I can tell you that we are completely in line with the goals of the Kazan, of the Kazan Action Plan. And they want to align physical education and sport policies with the SDGs, exactly what we do. Because this plan is really looking into the future. You can see here in the downline, fit for life will scale the impact and inclusive methodology of UNESCO's quality physical education project. And they call it, which was deemed one of the most remarkable and significant global initiatives in physical education in the last century. So something has happened in the international policy it is about, especially about, yeah, the COVID gave a push to that. You can see 41% decline in physical activity is the anal analysis. They say 80% of PE teacher report classes negatively impact. Anxiety and depression went up. And 70% of teachers say that physical and mental health of students worsened. So they say we need to take action. And as I said, two events. This year was in October, the Intergovernmental Sport Committee, CJEPS, met there. We were part of that and brought our projects in there. And next year, the conference in Baku, where Kazibantu will also be part of a working group. So this was a conference, yet two weeks ago. UNESCO chair is part and in the middle of all these projects. Next thing, infrastructure, Kazi Play. There is another document, Ready to Learn and Thrive. It is not focused on physical education, but it's focused on school health and nutrition around the world. And I will cite just the middle passage here. Good health, nutrition, and well-being are essential to maximize educational potential. Healthy, well-nourished, happy children and adolescents learn better and are more likely to lead healthy and fulfilling lives. Completely in line what we are doing. And in their strategy, in their key messages, we find quality education and school environment. And we now, that is the latest part of our project, looked at the school environment by Kazi Play. So this is the key message five. More attention must be paid to the school environment, UNESCO says, which is critical to health and learning. So we looked at schoolyards here. This is, for example, a school, primary school, where, together with architects, we looked at the structure of the schoolyard. As I said, nothing is there for physical activity. There were plans with colleagues from the Department of Architecture involved. Meanwhile, good connection, good collaboration. They designed schoolyard, designed possibilities for kids to be physically active, and we put that in practice. This is the schoolyard which we opened yesterday together. If, Mathieu. Yeah. Look at this. These are the kids playing there. And you will see some very inspiring pictures like this here. This way is amazing. And I will show you other pictures later on. <clears throat> this morning in the Herald, the Herald reported about that. University partnership brings joy to base school playgrounds. This is from this morning, fresh. Gerald sent us this morning. 
thank you for your applause. I, I like it that you appreciate what we are doing. But we are also looking at the toilets. This would be another big issue. It would be another big topic in one of the schools. We looked at the renovation of the schools. Yesterday, there were two handover ceremonies, and it was really emotional. A teacher said, we have now clean toilets. And she said, this is for us something you can't believe what that means. Going to a clean toilet is something of dignity. We have the feeling that we are looked after. It is something, with, she said, you can't imagine what it means if you go to a dirty toilet all the time and so on. So they really appreciate it. And she spoke from her heart and it was very emotional. Cheryl, wasn't it? We liked it so much. Yeah. So just a few examples later on. Um, but we, of course, we come from physical education. We would like to have reintroduced physical education in the curriculum again. This is a big aim, I, don't, I know. But it should be a subject on its own. And I, myself, personally, I say we should stop with, in my opinion, <laughs> one of the biggest misunderstandings in education, namely that physical education is of minor importance. Instead, the UPA, the European Physical Education Teacher Association, has a motto. They say, no education without physical education. And that, that is true. And if we continue with the UNESCO chair, and most probably we will do, we will work for that, that physical education gets another status. Because meanwhile, there is a lot of research on that. We do that in Basel. We call that PACO research. PACO research means physical activity and cognition. And we, re we do research on the impact of physical activity on the brain. This is new on the right side. We look how physical activity, for example, the school break or physical education lesson, can focus or can influence the concentration, the behavior, the memory, the motivation. So we make tests with the kids. We have special assessment possibilities. We have a very skillful research group leader, Sebastian Ludica, who does this research. We have a laboratory on that. So the kids do physical activity sessions, and then we compare those who have not done it with those who have done the physical activity, and they have to do special tasks, you see, on the computer, and we compare how the tasks are solved by the kids. And we can summarize that active kids are better learners. There is a huge research background behind that, which I only can mention here. But this is a good summary where it goes. Next thing is, we should care for the basic motor competencies of the kids. In Switzerland, we, we meanwhile measure them. This is, for example, a test for basic motor competencies, MOBAC, in grade one. That is to say, the kids here have to do special tasks. And we look if the tasks are fulfilled according to their uh, physical development. And if they don't do it, this is, we call it self-movement. And the other one is object movement. There is a ball uh, always involved. You can see them. And these tests exist for several grades. And we always look, as PISA does it, at the end of the school year, grade one, do the kids achieve the basic motor competencies for a healthy physical development? Because that is important to us. Finally, we see a lot of support here from the health science faculty. That is really good. That is to say, we would love, and this is my personal, I didn't speak with Cheryl about that, but I see a lot of potential here in the health science faculty when I looked at what is done here. So Kazi Bantu, Healthy Schools for Healthy Communities, 
should be, in my point of view, in future be an integral part of research and teaching at the health science faculty of Nelson Mandela University, especially in the human movement science department, no doubt, but also in an interdisciplinary way with dietetics and so on and so on. So I think there is a lot of potential. And of course, the physical education, teacher education must get a new push so that we get educated physical education teachers. Now I wonder what, if I should show this video because it shows the former dean of the health science faculty. But Lungile was such a strong supporter of our work that I allow myself to present his statement and this statement in the past gave us a lot of uh, push for our work. What's important is reaching out in to the relevant communities and the communities that are going to need the service of the university. University teaches, university does research, but also it needs to be of service to community. And therefore, a project of this nature, much as it advances the learnership, the scholarship of the university, the research agenda of the university, it also advances community engagement. Now, this one thing to advance community engagement, but it's another thing to be impactful in community engagement. It's a project of that nature which addresses it, it is what is key. key. He calls it, it is key. And when someone tells us, that gives us a very good feeling. But on the other hand, I see that the new dean, Prof. Singela, is also thinking in this way. I read in Herald recently that she mentioned with regard to the new school that Kazi Bantu project is designed to improve the health, nutrition and physical activity of school children and teachers, knowing how poor nutrition and inactivity negatively impacts children's ability to achieve in the classroom and reach their full potential. We do our part through this project in supporting communities to address these health challenges. So very much appreciated that the new dean also supports what we are doing. We were a big team when we started. When we started, we were small, but now we are quite a big team. And so a few words of thanks at the end. We wouldn't have gone so far without Jörg Utzinger and his team on the left side. Jörg is a great guy who gave us a lot of support, which helped us to push the project forward. And he also introduced us to the Swiss ambassador here next to me. She always supported us with everything she could do from the embassy side. So great, she even traveled to Port Elizabeth in order to be here. I mentioned Darrell van Hoynen. Darrell is in the middle and especially related to Kazi Health. She did an amazing job. We have, of course, Rosa on the right side. She is a big part of our project. You see Lungele. You see Andrew Leach. And also Andrew gave us his support. And when we came here, we always felt at home. But we also met the deputy vice chancellor. We had the feeling she understands what we want to do. She supports it and she appreciates that. So this is important for us that we have a feeling that we are welcome in the university with what we are doing. And this feeling is no doubt there. So, a lot of tasks, a lot of challenges. The main challenges are sustainability and funding. I don't want to speak about money today, but it is a challenge for the future. We had a meeting yesterday and with very emotional votes, all the participants said, we have reached so far, so much, we should continue. They want to do something for their country. That was really emotional and we will do it we collaborated for 10 years, and we have a lot more ideas, so it could even be 20 years, so, so many ideas. Sometimes you say, so what? I always tell so to, to my students, 
Why do we do that? So what? You must feel a sense. And sometimes you can have a one hour lecture, but sometimes it is only a short impression of a child. My name is Sierra de Cox. This year has been one of my best years because we were blessed with such an awesome jungle gym. My favorite thing to do is swing on the swing. It feels like I am flying. I really also enjoy climbing on the tires. Wednesdays are my favorite days because it is the day that the great threes get to play on the jungle gym. We are so thankful for the jungle gym. However, we would be even happier if there was another one so we could have another day to play. Thank you. So, could a lecture end better with such a statement? Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening to the big picture of our project. I appreciate that I could present it here. Thanks a lot. Wow, um, I think Uwe, you have certainly delivered a public lecture of note. I could see everybody hanging on your lips and you really kept everybody's attention for the full hour and a bit. So it's wonderful. I, mu I must say your summary of our collaborative journey is just superb. It really brought back a lot of memories for me and uh, to see how dark and black my hair was <laughs> all, those, <laughs> all those years ago, but also to see the, our young researchers who are here who were really just um, fresh undergrad students doing their master's degrees and now fully fledged researchers, two of them, two of our students on the verge of handing in their PhDs at the end of this year. It's just a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful journey that this Kazibantu project and our 10 year collaboration has um, resulted in. So please can you give over another hand of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of, of the Faculty of Health Sciences and the University, just a small token of our appreciation. Thank oh, you. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah, well, it's very kind of you. Thanks. Yes. Um, just a few words of thank you. I'd like to thank the many people who have joined us online. I'd like to know eventually what that number was because we were expecting quite a large audience um, online from Switzerland and other parts of the country. But also thank you very much for attending and, and joining us for this rather special lecture. Um, also, I'd like to thank the uh, Faculty of Health Sciences for the support, and uh, as well as Prof Foxcroft um, for her support for this public lecture. Um, and also the faculty IT team that Uwe has mentioned before, you know, of Claire, Anya, Jarita, and Philip. I mean, really, you guys have just been spectacular this whole week leading up with all the support and the, and the organizing. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Also, Angus from the University Media, Sheila from the North Campus Conference Center, Zandi and colleagues from the University's Media and um, Communication team. Thank you very much. And really on behalf of the Kazibantu project, I would also like to thank uh, the school children and the teachers from the 34 schools that we have been engaging with over the last 10 years as part of our three major projects um, starting all those many years ago. Uh, this rich engagement has been a vibrant learning experience for all of us. So um, thank you. I'd like to say goodbye to our online um, audience. Um, and I would like to thank the rest of you for being here today and invite you to join us for refreshments afterwards and also where you can engage with Uwe and uh, pick his brain a bit. You know. But thank you very much for attending and well done. Another hand of applause for Uwe. Thank you. Thank you.